There were three gypsies lived in the east, and all oh, bon they were bonny o. Oh. They sang so sweet at the castle game that they charmed the heart of the lady o. Oh. Okay, it's uh, great to be here this afternoon in uh, Calvin Town. Uh, it's Saturday the 18th of June. 2022 and we're here to have a chat with one of the greats of Ulster singing, Len Graham. How are you Len? Not too bad Cal. Good to see you. So, same here. Great to see you in the flesh. Yeah. <laughs> After all these last couple of years. Indeed, indeed. What have you, what have you been up to or how you sing? Well, we started to get live audiences again which has been a great bonus and uh, I've managed to do quite, quite a bit of work, uh, particularly from about March of this year. It's been Quite a bit, and mm -hmm. some pieces come uh, of all sorts mm -hmm. from senior citizens and then doing stuff with kids again, which I really missed. Mm -hmm. uh, like for over 30 odd years, mm -hmm. probably nearly 40 years, mm -hmm. working with uh, kids, particularly the cross community work that all just mm -hmm. stopped two years ago with yes. like, the pandemic, you know. But that's lucky enough, I started to, to go a little bit more open up again. Yeah. Well, we're just here today, I suppose, to. Um, just ask you um, about your life and uh, your life in song and, and all yeah. the rest. But I think, as most a good <coughs> starting point would be, um, as most where were you born yeah. and uh, just as most how the traditional singing. What was your first experiences of it? Yeah. And uh, I suppose how did it all begin for yeah. Len Graham? Yeah. Well, it began December of. 1944, <laughs> in the village of Glen Arm, up in the Glens of Antrim, County Antrim. And uh, the, the first recollections I have is of seeing my mother said, I came out singing, she said, uh, <laughs> that she sang to me in the womb. Yes. So certainly my earliest recollections are of song, you know. My father was working in Glasgow, mm -hmm. and uh, they were living in Glen Arm, my older brother in arms. Uh, he's six years older than me, and uh, we, we I just started singing at a very early age. I think the very first song I heard would have been uh, Fair Rosa, I think was the very first song I would have a recollection of them singing to me and learning. Mm -hmm. Like I learned that as a, like I remember singing that since yeah. I was only really top, you know. Yes, yes. And uh, it wasn't until later that I found that it was a musical version of uh, the Grimm's fairy tale, mm -hmm. uh, The Briar Rose, which was published in 1812, but mm -hmm. they had it as a song. My grandmother had been born about the 1870s, yes. and uh, she obviously had it in her repertoire from her family, so it was handed down. That would be the first song that you would, I would remember, and that would be what you would call a traditional song. Of course, I didn't have that. Terrible. Definition. I, <laughs> yeah. folk, I never heard it. Yeah. Term. Yeah. They just talked about the old song. Yes. You know? yes. And funny enough, whenever I, I, I eventually became familiar with the Sam Henry collection, mm -hmm. uh, which came via my uncle cutting them out of the local newspaper. Not every one of them because there were nearly a ton of them, but he cut out a good number of them. Shoebox full of them he cut out. Yes. They were published from 1923 to 1939. Mm -hmm. Yes. So uh, they were numbered. Yes. So I realised that there, there were a lot of them were missing. So when I was in to, well into my teens, I found out that Sam Henry, the collector from Coleraine, had uh, lodged two uh, scrapbooks up in the Central Library in Belfast. So then I started going up there and filling in some of the gaps, you know. So traditional singing was in your it was family, in the, you yeah. mentioned your grandmother, but, yeah, uncle. Yeah. But they just called them owl songs, you know. Uh, just songs, uh, yeah. Owl songs, like I never heard I never heard the word tradition being used. Is that a sort of a term that came in maybe yeah, later on? Yeah, it came in later on. Traditional or folk song. Yeah, people started you know, defining them with what they were, you know. Yeah, yeah. Like even Sam just called them songs of the people. Songs of the people. He did, I think yeah. he ever used that term, right? Mm -hmm. But um, there, there were songs of the locality and other songs like like well, say I'm talking about like going right back to, to the beginning when yeah. you, you weren't you weren't able to comprehend maybe some of the bigger songs, but then I started pricking my ears up, uh, you know that there were songs mentioned in the locality, you know, mm -hmm. 
uh, Glenarm, who they mentioned in the song, they both sang a song in unison together. In being on the fine September morn, the weather in being warm, it fell my lot to stroll along the bay of sweet Glenarm. The yellow corn was waving ripe, and the fields were bright and gay, and the blue seas washed the pebbles white along Glenarm Bay. Oh, she says, my dear, if you're sincere, here is my heart and hand. When well love bands are coming on, la, 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 la. and when old age is creeping on, and her locks are turning grey, I will always mind that harvest morn we met along the bay, and the blue seas watched the pebbles white along the land. Day and there's a whole other version. What do you call it? That's Glenarm Bay. Beautiful, lovely air. Yeah, and that 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 appears in the Henry collection as well. Yeah. So local. Oh, that's that's very local. Yeah. But my uncle wrote a parody to it. Between the two villages, there's only a mile between the two villages of Glenarm and Carnmore. Yes. And out in Glenarm Bay, there's a big black rock or carrick do. Uh, out in the bay, you see, yes. and he uh, wrote a bit of a parody on it when he had the black rock as white with seagulls along Glenarm Bay. <laughs> <laughs> of course, uh, young fellow, that'd be the, the version you would learn. You know? <laughs> well, then there was other songs uh, about um, tragedies. There was there was a, a regatta. Now this wouldn't be like the Henley regatta with a river. This would be fishing villages like uh, Glenarm and Carnlock and Cushendall and. Cushion done, the, 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 the local fishermen would have a regatta every year with clinker boats, boats rolling against each other. And there was a tragedy out, I think it was in around the 1860s, out in, uh, out in the bay where, where three young lads from Carnlock were drowned. There was a song about that, a uh, local uh, songsmith, a uh, bard called uh, Frank uh, Poet Mackay. He wrote a uh, his most famous song would be Sweet Carnlock Bay. Right. And the one ahead, so he was a local man. But he wrote a song about that tragedy. And then there was an, another one, even going further back, <clears throat> about a shipwreck that went down uh, in the 1830s, 1834, I think it was. The Enterprise was, was sailing from Peru uh -huh. to Glasgow. With, uh, they were supposed to be laden with gold and uh, uh, indigo. Mm -hmm. Indigo dye for the, mm -hmm. the the textile industry over in Scotland, and it went down off the arm. There was a, there was a, uh, a song about that. Yes. And funny enough, uh, Hamish Henderson, the School of Scottish Studies, was collecting songs in Argyllshire uh, in the nineteen fifties, and he came across a song <coughs> for the same shipwreck. Mm -hmm. It just shows you that. How close? The, 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 the yeah. thir Thirteen miles. Exactly. Yeah. You know, so a, a shipwreck that went down yeah. off Glenarm also affected the people over in in uh, Argyllshire. Yeah. You know, no more than tired. So, yeah. so, so, so you were there was a lot of. I mean, your your sort of foundation or base, if you like, was your the local songs, your your family, yeah. as you mentioned, and then you obviously went to the Linen Hall Library yeah. and class. Um, you know, the thing about it, the thing that strikes me listening to what you just said there, it, you know, sort of the, the, it was all really something you had to make an effort, for want of a better description, to get a song. Oh, yeah. You know, whereas now there was, there's so much technology oh. and that, it's so easy to get a song and a yeah, piece yeah. of music or whatever, you know. Well, I mean, the, the resources now are just yeah, phenomenal. Absolutely, like yeah. I had to, like, I'd be getting songs of people that were born in the, you know, the, latter end of the 19th century, I yeah. hadn't really sung for years, yeah. Yeah. it could only be re recalled in the verse or two, and lucky enough, uh, the Henry collection sometimes would have that song, but not, not all the yeah. time, yeah. You know, not yeah. all the time, like one song, like I remember uh, mm -hmm. going through the, the, the whole collection from 1923 to 1939, and I didn't copy the whole lot because, I, I, you know, I would only go for uh, particular mission maybe yes. and, and copy out for it because it cost you a fortune to yes. afford it a copy at the time, like eight hundred odd songs, you know. Yeah. So uh, I was going through the collection and uh, there was a footnote in one of the songs in the I think it was the nineteen thirties at some stage, looking for a song that my uncle had given me. <clears throat> it was called The Lock Do Poachers. And uh, it goes through and land up to nineteen thirty nine. 
and it never appeared in, 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 it never appeared in the newspaper or comics or they, they were published every week. So it was a great way of collecting when you think of it. Mm -hmm. Like he would, once a week he would put a song and it, it sold it in the newspaper. Oh, like a lot of people told me they bought the paper because of that. Yeah. The the songs, ones there for it. Song, yeah. Songs and people, you know. Yeah. But uh, there was a footnote uh, asking for a song called The Long Dew Poachers. Mm -hmm. And it never appeared. So I said to my uncle, I said, I, I noticed the, uh, the song didn't, uh, the, the, the Long Dew Poachers didn't appear in, in the collection. Oh, so she must be joking. No, so the, the, the penny dropped. It seemed he was he was a well known poacher himself. <laughs> As a matter of fact, my mother, my mother, who was a bit younger, Obviously. a good bit younger than him, had a job one time of uh, sewing poachers' pockets into a big gabardine. He was a, over six foot tall. Yes, and, and he wore this big gabardine when he was going off to poach. And she sewed these big pockets, and he could put a salmon in there and a salmon in there. You know, <laughs> walk past the barracks, and they wouldn't know what he was carrying. You know. So, so it did never appear, and that was a, a song that he gave me. The, the, the long two poetry. Well, let me try a bit of it. Yeah, it didn't appear in the, in the collection. Well, that's one well, Do you want to hear now? That's intriguing. <clears throat> Treat me now. It starts off again. Ending in the month of August in the year of '82. Us gallant boys been on a spree, went out to shoot a lot too. At Tommy Moore's of Teeny's town, we all assembled there. With liquor and provision, oh, we did ourselves prepare. The liquor in was very good, and we all drank our fill. Then rank and file, we all set forth for Mullock Sandal Hill. When we arrived at the top, the police came in view. First came Bell the land steward, likewise the keepers too. Since we came here for the shoot over mountain, hill and field, like true born Irish men, oh, we would never yield. Of police and gamekeepers, oh, we were not afraid to shoot the hills from Killy Glen away round to Mockvain. Come all you gallant poachers, let love your dog and gun. These hills and glens are yours to shoot, from keepers do not run. For if you do, you'll surely rue, if you don't stand your ground. You'll find yourself transported to Van Diemen's landy bound. Now if you want their names explained, the truth I'll tell to you. There's Tom McGill and Richard and John Green from Great Do, Old McCullough and McClure and James Mills, my old friend. And the poet's name I won't explain, he lives at the Hill End. Now to conclude and finish, I here will end my, I now will end, drop my pen. And many's a happy hour I spent over mountain, hill and glen. For fishing and for fowling it is my heart's delight. And courting pretty fair mates as we came home at night. It's another 40 verses. Uh, that's, uh, that's an interesting one there. Yeah. So, so you were, you were the, there's a lot of, you know, you... It was sort of a, a labour of love, really. Well, um, I got I got infected with. It sort of was a yeah, drug. <laughs> For one better. Well, my fellow used to call it a disease. <laughs> <laughs> but it was just something that I don't know. It just came naturally. And then, I, I suppose, if you go forward, I'm sure there's a lot more there. You know, I suppose then you met, and um, we're all aware of this. Anybody watching this here, um, this interview, you met the wonderful. Joe Holmes. Yeah, well, there's a story behind that too. How did that happen? <coughs> Where did that happen? At this stage, I think I have to mention the Antrim and Early Fiddlers. <gasps> yeah. Now, there was two men, two friends of my father's, very important men. Uh, they were a duo. Uh, Willie Hope played the Ellen Pipes. Told my father he was a direct descendant of Jemmy Hope of 1798 fame, and he came from the same area. He was from a place called Ballymure. And his uh, sidekick was a fiddler called David Nowinney from Donadry. And they were a well known, right going, like, like they were much older than, than, than me, of course, and my father was. Well, uh, uh, David was about the same age as my father. 
but uh, Willie had been born back in the 50s, like the 1880s, I think he had been born. He died in the, the 1950s, 1959, I think he died. But I, I met him at the Antrim and Dairy Fiddlers back in the 50s. But back in 1951, those two men went down to Mullingar for that inaugural meeting. Well, they weren't called cultists, it was uh, Leo Rolson and Jim Seary, the Pipers Club in Dublin, organised the first uh, gathering in Mullingar in 1951. And they all met in a hotel, the Midland Hotel in uh, Mullingar in that first year. And uh, that was 1951. So the two boys came back home and decided that something had to be done in the north as well because they reckoned that there was a lot of big major changes happening uh, with all the, the, the inventions that were coming in with the radio and what well, television hadn't arrived at that stage, but there certainly was a lot of changes in, in, you know, that were happening. The Americans had been overstaying in, in, in the country and uh, brought a lot of new traditions came in at that time. The wireless was putting out a lot of American music and a lot of the old traditions were under threat, as I could see a lot of the old dances and the old singing traditions and music traditions were under threat. So they decided in 1953 to form the Andrew Derry Fiddlers. Along people like uh, Alec Kerr was one of the, the, the original people, Mickey McElhatton, and uh, very much uh, uh, cross community before cross community became uh, like a yeah, 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 yeah. organization. Yeah, like before before that became sort of known as cross community. Was, the term cross community didn't exist. Yeah, no, it just came up. Yeah, 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 just just good neighbours. They all. Yeah. Mickey Michael Hatton told me that he learned the fiddle from his pre Presbyterian neighbour, yeah. Willie Willie McAllister was his tutor. You know, so I mean the whole thing was. Yeah. That's the way things were. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, so that was, uh, I started going along to some of those gatherings and uh, then they would intersperse the Knights Fiddlers, it was mostly Fiddlers, you see, would be in Antrim and the Northern Counties was the predominant instrument would be the fiddle, although you would have had the occasional um, flute player and whistle player. Uh, Willie would have been quite unique. You see, back in the 50s, the Ellen Pipes was like a rare breed, like you could hear you know, it was. You, you, the Rolson's making uh, the pipes in Dublin. I think it was a man in, in, in Cork called Kennedy making pipes. And uh, McFadden, and then there was another man, but he died in the 40s, a man called, uh, he lived in Belfast, uh, Richard O'Neilly. He lived in Belfast, he, he made the Ellen pipes, but he died in 1949, I think he died. So there were, there were like, there were definitely a Nearly, almost to that, that point. Yes, yes. And then, of course, now it is. It's all over the world. Yeah. Right in pipes and pipe makers. So uh, they would intersperse the night's proceedings with singers. Mm -hmm. I have met singers there at those gatherings. People like uh, Mary uh, McGill, great, great singer. Sheena Heffern and our brother Sammy, <coughs> great singers. Uh, Willie Nickel, who the tops. He was uh, uh, John Kennedy's uh, mentor, and John would be there as a young, young man with black hair, like when I first met him back in the 50s, he was a young man, you know, a bit older, a bit older, he was only a youngster at the time when I first met John. Willie Nickel was a great singer, great songs. Um, uh, Hugh Carson, uh, the man, the first man I heard singing Western Winds was Hugh Carson, he was a school teacher. Uh, Tommy Kelly, another great singer. So the, we, you'd have heard singers, and then eventually I started to be called up to sing at these gatherings as well. So in 1963, I'd been, uh, wasn't quite, I was 18, wasn't quite, I wasn't 19, up to that. Uh, this would be the autumn, probably September, October of that year. I was called up to sing, and I sang one of the grandmother's songs, and uh, one of the fiddlers came up and asked me for the words. And uh, that was Joe Holmes. That was Joe Holmes. Got, got, I got his address and uh, I called around. His mother had died. His mother apparently had been, a, not just by Joe's account, but by people that uh, knew her, said she was a great singer, and very much a Keeley house. And people called in, uh, singers would have called in, and, and Keeley didn't know them, you know. So Joe was playing the fiddle at this fiddle, and singing. He was a singer, but he, oh, yeah. he, he didn't sing out. So he was publicly a fiddle player? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. he played the, the Keeley band up on. Malloy's Killy Man, oh. up in Aramoy, 
They wouldn't have signed one, would they? No, you see, you see, you see, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. No, Very interesting. All, all the singing was done at home. He was sung in jet with his mother at home. Yeah. It was right. Uh, it was very much a, a Cayley house, but it wasn't the. Uh, it wasn't for public consumption. <laughs> you know, it, wasn't, just it wasn't platforms. Keep it yeah, it wasn't. You know, well, a lot of the places were like that, you know. You know, like, to, like I saw down from Derry for this was handy. It gave a lot of those singers a platform, you know, yes, including yes. myself. Yeah. So the song I sang was the more of Shore. <laughs> and you'll probably be uh, people watching this will be uh, familiar with the version that uh, the Lord's King, uh, or Cain, I should say, recorded. And um, she got it from her aunts, uh, Sir and Rita, and they in turn got it off a 78 RPM record that John McGettigan recorded the way back in the 20s in New York. Came back to Ireland and they recorded, they learned from that. But the version I had was, it was, it was a bit different, but it's the same song, but it's just a, a bit different melody and the words are slightly different, you know. I'll sing, sing a few yeah, yeah, things. <clears throat> You hills and dales and flowery vales, land lie near the Murloc shore. You winds that grows over Martin's Hill, will I ever see you more? Where the primrose grow and the violet too, and the trout and salmon play, till with line and hook, delight I too. Or to spend my youthful day. Last night I went for to see my love, for to hear what she would say, that she might take some pity on me, for I was going away. She says I love a sailor lad, he's the one I do adore. So take this forth, your answer now. I am trouble me no more. Farewell unto Lord Antrim's groves, where stands the bleaching green, where the linen lay webs lie clean and white, and the crystal streams run still, where many's a happy hour I spent, but now alas there o'er, since the girl I love has left me far, far from the Murloc shore. So I landed up, there's more verses, there's more verses now. And I landed up with the song to Joe's uh, some nights afterwards up in Killy Rammer in St. Man Money. And Joe started singing. And much to my surprise, I, you know, like I knew him as a fiddler. Yeah. And everybody knew him as a fiddler, but geez, it turned out he was. Buckets of songs, you know. So he just, that, that song was the, the, the introduction to Joe, and he started singing, and that was the, the beginning of, that was 1963, and that went on for 15 years. He died in 1978. And did you sort of go around the country? Oh, yeah, we had, we had, a, whole, we had a whole network of, of Cayley houses all yeah. over the place. And but even on, the, even on the national front, you were oh, yeah. gigs and yeah, we were, we were we everywhere, weren't you? Well, yeah, we were, we were asked abroad. And, States and everything, but Joe, Joe, Joe well, I, I, I did this big tour in 1976, the Byzantine, and uh, then we, Joe and I were asked to do the, the Smithsonian one in, in, in Washington, D.C., but Joe, yeah. Joe didn't, didn't go feel really well. He died a couple of years after that. I think he had, a, he must have been having, he didn't say anything, but I, I think he must have been having wee bits of warnings, bits of flutters. And, and you sort of recorded it? Oh, things. we did. We did albums we did, together. Yeah. As oh, well. we did. We did. We did two two albums. We were a couple of calls of you. Yeah. The first one was called Chase Muses, Bard and Sages, and the second one was called After Dawning, which came out. It was recorded just a few weeks before he died, and it came out just after. Oh, that, nice, yeah. Nice. Yeah. But then Joe, Joe, Joe just opened up with a whole uh, rake of, of great, great, great songs. That, uh, I think the, the, the thing about you know a lot of singers, including myself, when I mean obviously I never met Joe Holmes, you know, those recordings, those albums, <coughs> they were really much the Ulster songs and Lintz and Northern. Yeah, yeah. You know, there, there was just a tour de force album of singing together and you listening yeah. to him and obviously singing solo and lilting. It was nothing really had ever been maybe commercially recorded like as yeah. like that authenticity. Well, you know? commercial, commercial Before, probably yeah. commercial would probably for it, yeah, know, because yeah. although it was quite a tradition, like Joe sang with his mother, and yeah, 
yeah. think that the Butcher Brothers sang together in unison. Joe uh, Eddie sang with his wife Gracie. Not, not an awful lot, but a, a few songs he sang in, yeah. uh, in unison together. No, it wasn't totally unusual, but it, as you said, it was very much a, a subculture that wasn't uh, commercialized. Commercialized, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it was sort of in house, as yeah. you said, you know. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I. I, I like I'd be listening to like like when you're a songaholic like as as I was from my early years. Like it's <laughs> it, 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 uh, like you, you were you were listening like the, the wireless was was a source as well. Yes. Like um, back in the fifties, uh, there, there was a program came out. Uh, Sean Boyle was very much involved in it with the BBC. Did a musical survey uh, back in the early fifties. And uh, Sean O'Boyle got the nine counties of Ulster, Seamus Ennis got the other <coughs> 23 counties, but Sean, <coughs> Sean covered the nine counties, including the Gilta. Mm -hmm. And every uh, Sunday that programme would go out for a couple of years, that went out um, as I rolled out. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sarah Makem, Tommy Makem's mother, uh, sang the signature song every, every week. As I rode out in the May morning, in the May morning, light early, <coughs> I met me love upon the way, O oh Lord, but she was early. And she sang, do, 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 jide along the dean, jide along the dean, she landed. Her shoes were black and her stockings white, and her buckles shone like silver. She had a dark and a robe and a hay, and her earrings tipped her shoulder. And she sang, do, 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 Jail on the day, jail on the day, shall land But she didn't sing the whole song, it was only about three words. I had to wait for a few years to get the rest of the song because it, it was, she only sang the, the signature song, maybe it was two or three verses, she sang a brave Sunday. Yeah, yeah. So that, that, of course, she would uh, be writing like mad down to get those couple of verses, you know, and had to, had to wait a few years to get the rest of it. And then there was another programme, we called it Athlone at home. And uh, I think it was because that's where the Earl was uh, in Athlone that broadcast. Uh, it was a Saturday. There was a couple of programmes, but one particular was the Waltons uh, sponsored programme every Saturday lunchtime, went out again in the 1950s. And uh, Leo McGuire presented it every week. Clever man. Mm -hmm. He would uh, copyright it, everything, you know, because he must have made a fortune. Because uh, uh, I remember singing. Learning, learning a song of, uh, that, that was on there. It was uh, Joe Lynch, who became famous as an actor on Glen Road. Oh. He was better known in the 50s as a singer. Than anybody. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's that's right. Right. That's but he, he was a singer. Matter. He was a singer along with the home. Oh, yeah, a good singer too. And uh, I remember getting one of his songs back in the 50s and learning it. Uh, and it was McGuire that wrote, wrote it. But he based it on an old traditional song. Yes. Uh, the whistling gypsy came over the hill and down through the valley so deep. That's based on an old song, you know, an old ballad, actually, an old ballad. And lo and behold, I, I sang this, sang this to Joe. He said, Oh, I said, I heard that old My mommy had that version that Joe says. Mm -hmm. And uh, he started singing the, the, his version of the, the Dark Eyed Gypsy. I don't know what that portion. Cordial there. <laughs> ah, liquors. Liquors. <clears throat> Um, what was it now? The Dark Eyed Gypsy, she sang. Well, I didn't hear it, but Joe sang it. But it was her, his mother that he got it off. And um, there were three gypsies lived in the east, and oh, one they were bonnie, oh. They sang so sweet, and the castle gained. That the charm, the heart of the lady, oh. She gave to them the sparkling wine, and she gave to them the brandy, oh. And the gay gold ring that the lady wore, she gave to the dark eyed gypsy, oh. And then the Lord comes home, he's saying, She's gone off with the gypsies and he rides on, he catches up on them. And uh, are you going to leave your house and your land? Are you going to leave your children three? I would leave them all 
for the one I love, and I'll follow my dark eyed Jim say Then she took the garment and she wore, and she wore it as a hen dress, oh. Then I'll eat the grass, and I'll drink the dew, for the love of my dark eyed Jim say, oh. Last night I lay on a fine feather bend, my own wedded Lord beside me, oh. But this night I lie on the cold barn floor in the arms of my dark eyed Jim Sayo. That was his mother's version of the, the same, you see, the same theme as what Leo McGuire copyrighted. And he made a fortune out of that because the Clancy Brothers recorded it. Big business man, didn't he? Bob Dylan recorded it. Oh. Uh, oh. uh, Peter Paul Amir recorded it. Oh, he yeah. made a fortune out of it. So, uh, Professor Francis Child of Harvard University mm -hmm. has it as number 200 of his narrative balance. Mm -hmm. And he tells us that it's based on an actual event that happened back in the early part of the, the uh, 17th century. A certain John Kennedy, the sixth Earl of Cassilis in Argyllshire, his wife Lady Jane Hamilton ran off with jo Johnny Fa, the King of the Gypsies. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the Lord went after them and caught the seven of them. They were all executed at Maybole Castle. And there's a tower there. He locked her up in the, in the tower and got, he got married again. Mm -hmm. uh, but she was locked up for the rest of her life in the tower at Maybole. And then he built a big place over uh, up the road uh, sometime when the, the, the family are still living there. Then the Kennedys are still living there. And Joe got this from his mother. He got that version from his mother. But it's, it's one of those songs that turns up all over the place. Over in America, and everything it turns up. Like whatever Alan Lomax was recording for, this, for the Library of Congress, he collected a version from uh, Woody Guthrie mm -hmm. that he had got. They, they lived over in Oklahoma. And she had a version of it. Not, not that version, but the same theme mm -hmm. and the same event that had been recorded. Uh, and. You can hear in the recording, 1941, Lomax asking Woody Guthrie, where'd you get that song, Woody? Got that from my old mother. You see, my mother, he said, was a, an ear player. That don't mean she wriggled her ears when she was singing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to say that most of, the, most of the people that I met over the years were, were ear players, and there's very few of them who would have been able to musically sing. No, 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 no. So you were with Joe for, was it 15 years? Yeah. Yeah. So, so in that time, I suppose, you sort of travelled the length and breadth of oh, the yeah. and like, you would have met singers, I suppose, along the way, like Eddie Butcher oh, and yeah. Jordy Hannah. Well, that's another story. Uh, that's another story. That's another story. Okay, yeah. <laughs> my, Let's go there. My <laughs> father used to say that I was like a terrier dog, and I got a, a whiff of a, of a song and followed me away, uh, chasing the scent. <laughs> and I heard that there was a singer, <coughs> and he had a very unusual address, this man, a man called Jimmy Spallon. And he lived in number six, the Twelve Apostles, Castle Rock, and oh, Right. So I got him headed off for the Twelve Apostles and the uh, Twelve <laughs> Labourers' Cottages as part of the, the Downhill Estate. There had been a big castle there at one time, but the, the, the roof had been taken off because the, the last of the, the family, the, the Harvey Bruce's, had died. Well, the, the story was. The boy that I went to see anyway had been a coachman, a, a, a groomsman for for the for the Harvey Bruce's in the big castle, you see. And I said, What happened to the, 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 there's no roof in that place? He said, You believe it or not, there's not a window in that place. Do you know how many windows that are in there? And I said, No, there's one for every day of the year. There's three hundred and sixty-five windows. So I didn't bother counting them, but I believed them anyway, but there was no roof on the place. Do you know what happened to that place? He said. I worked for me. The, 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 the Harvey Bruce came in and he said, saddled up a horse for me. And I saddled the horse up for him. And he went off galloping with the horse. He, t he tethered the horse up, he says, at Love's Pub in Castle Rock, went in and drank a bottle of whiskey and came out, threw the leg over the horse. And the, the, the railway gates went down and the, 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 the dairy, the Belfast train was, was due to come across. And he didn't wait. He, he, he took the horse to jump the level crossing gate and the, the horse bolted 
when he went to hand over shit and broke his neck. He said, that was the end of the Harvey Murphy's success. And that was where they had to take the roof off to pay the death duties. <laughs> so anyway, in the process of hearing that story, he, he started playing the whistle and singing. He had, I don't think he had one whole song, but he had all these snippets of songs and, and he had the melodies on the tin whistle. And he says, we got to get those songs. And he says, there's three brothers live up the road there, he says. There's Robert, at the, 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 that's the level crossing here is Castle Rock. The next level crossing is Umbra. And the Umbra gates, he says, there's a man that was in there called Robert Butcher. And then the next crossroad you come to is the Achel, he says. And then there to the right is Eddie Butcher. And then the next, you pass Ballerina Station, he says, in the next place you come to is Drummond Valley, is the third brother, John. Great men, those men are all good singers. You get the out of the road, boy, you'll hear some song. <laughs> well, I landed up, I was too late. I just missed Robert. Robert had died, mm -hmm. but Eddie was still very much to the fore. His other younger brother, John, was very much to the fore, but a drum of Valley. That was the beginning of another. I landed up at Eddie's. And I wasn't in the house five minutes to Eddie had me singing. He wasn't interested in anything only songs like that. <laughs> song I met, I you met met another song then? I, I met me match and uh, that was the beginning. I, I stayed there till the wee hours of the morning and drank well, who, crazy. Who was the man you met before that introduced you? So oh, Jimmy, Jimmy Spallon. Jimmy Spallon, Jimmy Spallon. Yes, sorry. The, mm -hmm. the Twelve Apostles. It's interesting now, that's good. Twelve Apostles. What a number of guys. Are you Oh yeah. <laughs> I had to sort that one out. So that was Major Dutch and Eddie. Eddie. And, um, I uh, sang there and Eddie sang and uh, I said, can I bring a friend over? Well, it's a, it's a male or female, it's, it's male. Well, it doesn't matter. He said, what, sing? Can, they, can they sing? And he said, he said, go ahead. So I brought Joe over the next uh, few <coughs> days later, we landed up and that was the beginning, of course. Oh, they, 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 they both fell in love with Joe and, and Gracie loved, loved Joe. They all, everybody but he met Joe just fell in love with him. He's just that person. Yeah. You know? Yeah. 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 So that was the beginning of another friendship, and that went on for both. And he survived Joe's death, and uh, he died in 1980. He was born in 1900, Joe was born in 1906. So then uh, there was various other, like there's numerous people, God, a number. And did you see you met, um, of course, uh, I know you and Cattle were yeah, yeah. collaborating I met, I met, I met, together. I met, I met Cattle at the All Iron Fla. Uh, in Clones in 1964. Right. And uh, that, that was the beginning of a friendship as well. And mm -hmm. uh, Cattle asked me up to meet the father and mother. And yes. I, I did that sometime. And I brought Joe up to meet them as well. And that friendship went on. And then Cattle joined the, the, the Boys of the Rock and <coughs> went off to live in, in, in Edinburgh sometime. Well, the, the, the Boys of the Rock were formed about 1967 or 68, I think. Yes. But he lived in both. I think the, the full time in the 1970s started uh, touring with them, you know, so that sort of curtailed things. And then I, of course, joined the band as well. And with Cattle and you, I know um, sure. you published a thing with the Northern Ireland Arts Council, uh, which was recordings of both songs and music that you did throughout the North yeah. in the 60s, 1960s, and 1970s. There was, a lot, was that, a lot of that was recorded with Cattle, wasn't it? Yeah, not, not, not exclusively, but it was no. There's a few. There's a few tracks out of that came, right. came out of that. But we, we did we did quite a bit uh, in those few years before he went off with the band. We did quite a bit around Monaghan, and uh, I took him up to, to uh, meet the the Doherty's up in Donegal, and uh, took him up to meet Ed, Eddie and Joe, of course, Cal, and uh, then we, we went around uh, parts of Fermanagh, and McCoy was mentioned last night in the concert. Yes. And uh, the Halpins were great, great singers from from Liston Skay up that way, and very we did quite a bit. It's not really from Three Mile House. And that's right, Mary Mar Mar uh, McEntee. McEntee. She yes. was very much in the fla scene at that stage during the sixties. We didn't we didn't let her. You collected songs. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah a lot of field recordings and yeah, yeah. out there as, yeah. as we as we call it. Oh, as yeah. well. You know, but they were never recorded in the field. I don't well, remember. That's what I'm <laughs> I know they were, they were recorded many of the places. And and then of course, um, when would you or when did you sort of bump into or meet Jordy Hanna as well? That's another story. 1968, the, 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 the second All Ireland was held in uh, Clonus, right? And I was competing, and the, the judicator was judicators were, were uh, 
to, to school teachers, uh, Sean O'Boyle and Jerry Hicks, they were both school teachers yes. in uh, St. Pat's College in, in, in Armagh, so they were helping my introduction to the Royals, mm -hmm. and uh, they uh, were very kindly to me. I was second uh, to Nicholas Tobin, who was number, he was first in the, the All Ireland that year, was number one. And we became friends with uh, Sean, and both of them were, were very encouraging and a yes. great help to me. Right. Whenever the big book came out uh, in 1975, folk songs of uh, the, 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 the came out of that collection of the BBC survey, mm -hmm. uh, the folk songs of uh, Britain and Ireland oh, came yes. out. Yes. Uh, Sean asked me that they, they, were, they were reviewing it on on BBC, and he asked me to come in and sing a few songs in the studio. Mm -hmm. And um, he was great; he gave me great encouragement over the years. Yeah, well, yeah. Those, those, those are the sort of things when you're young, you get uh, people that, 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 you know, like I never, I, I, like I must say, like everybody was, was you know, they were always very, very generous uh, with, with their well, songs and with their encouragement, you know. I know with myself, just on that point, um, you know, I take this opportunity now when we're sort of being officially recorded or you're being officially recorded. You were a great sense of encouragement to me growing up. I mean, um, when, I, when I see something young, you know, coming along. I mean, I first met you when I was about 10 or 11 years old. Yeah. And the company, I met you in a wee place called Ruski, which was yeah. Gorton and County Tyrone. And I remember, you know, I was just a cub, as we yeah. call it in Tyrone. Yeah. And you were along with John Campbell. And I remember, <laughs> you know, you were a renowned singer. That's the, you know, you know, I was just a young lad who was very enthusiastic about the whole thing. And, you know, you were very encouraging. Yeah, you know, just take this opportunity now to publicly, if you like, thank you for it. Oh, you know? no, sure, that's the, the and you're always at the end of the phone if I needed any questions no, answered or anything, anything, you know. Like I said, I'm you know, always and that's that, that, as you say, that's well, I mean, that, that means that, a lot, that, you know. That, 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 means so a lot. That, that's what kept me going was, was getting that uh, encouragement and from, from my own family and from, from people that I met along the road. And always, I don't think I ever encountered anybody that didn't. <laughs> Help me along the road, you know. But just when you mentioned Sean O'Boyle, um, just the the um, I think this is a very interesting story. I'd like you to tell it. Uh, we've talked about it a few times over the years. It was something about an event. Was it in Uri? Oh yes, yes, yes. Sean O'Boyle, yes. you were there. And, uh, sure. It was a gathering. Of, it was a, <laughs> it was a gathering of singers, and uh, Ulster singers particularly. And uh, who all was there? There was Sir Alan Hill and Jordy were there. Joe Holmes was there. Eddie wasn't there at this stage. Um, Paddy Tunney. Paddy Tunney was there. Well, anyway, it, it was a whole gathering of singers for this thing. Mm -hmm. And Sean O'Boyle was part of the, 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 it was called a seminar. It was a singing, a singing seminar. Right. And uh, it was organized. It was in the Ardmore Hotel, which is now the PSNI uh, headquarters. Demolished and I think it was actually blown up, <laughs> and uh, it's now it's now the PSN. <laughs> but it was a hotel. But at this stage, stage back in the well, Joe was alive, so it must be about mid seventies, seventy five, we'll call it. And uh, Sean was given a talk. You see, in this collecting that he did in the nineteen fifties, in his big reel to reel tape recorder, and he was playing examples of it. He had a notebook and he had. A, Reel to reel, and it was a counter on. He was able to fast forward or rewind and play these uh, big reel to reel recordings that he had. Lovely, lovely recordings that he had made of singers, including Sarah Megan and Paddy Tunney's mother, Bridget, and various singers that he played over the, the while. And at the end of the uh, talk, I think it went on for an hour, maybe an hour and a half, he seemed it was very interesting, some lovely recordings, you see. And uh, at the end of it, there was a question and answer, you see, and uh, somebody in the audience asked, uh, well, how would you define a traditional singer? You know, what, what makes a traditional singer, you know? And uh, Sean just sort of paused for a minute. He said, just give me a minute, give me a minute. And he consulted his notes and, uh, oh yes, yes, just give me a second. I have find this here, I have the, I have the number here. I don't know whether he fast forward or rewind, but he pressed the button and he was watching the country and he he stopped it. No, he said, that's that year, 1953, and the singer here is George Hanna, and I'm going to play 
a song, a song, the song was called The Factory Girl, and he pressed the button, he played one verse of it. And he stopped it, and he said, now, just by coincidence, there's two people in the audience here today, there's a Jordi Hanna, who would be a nephew of that man that I'm after playing, and uh, I would ask Jordi, would you mind getting up and singing maybe the next verse of that song? Jordy got up and he sang the first two of the Factory Girl and sat there and I was with him. And by coincidence, there's another lady here, and her name's Sir Anne O'Neill, who happens to be a sister of the previous singer and a niece of the first singer. And I'm going to ask you, Sir Anne, now please, would you sing first three of the Factory Girl? Sir Anne got up and did what she was told to do and sat there. Now, I would say that would be my definition of what traditional singing is about. You heard George Hanna singing The Factory Girl, you heard Geordie Hanna singing The Factory Girl, and you heard Sir Anne singing The Factory Girl. They weren't identical, were they? <laughs> <laughs> they weren't, they weren't identical. The wee George was very straight. Yeah, yeah. Don't yeah. think it was one burl in the way, or it was George, George used to talk about burls, burls. Put the burls in. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Jordy put plenty of burdens in, and Sir Anne lesser to lesser, but not, you know, decorated, but not over decorated, you know. So individuality, so individuality is what it's all about, you know. He says, you know, everybody should find their own voice and their own way of singing the song. There's no right way of doing it, you just do it. You see, that, 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 that um, is most the reason I wanted you to tell that story is because it leads into my next point. When people talk about obviously what is a traditional song, mm -hmm. right, is the first thing, or folk song as some people prefer to call it, mm -hmm. or what is the Ulster style of singing. You know, this is, you quoted a story from Sean O'Boy who was, shall we say, an, an authority of mm -hmm. a collector, uh, published works. Um, there is no definitive no. overall style. It's, no. as you say, individuality, no. you know, there's three members of the one family, oh, an yeah. uncle, a nephew and a niece, yeah, yeah. George Hannah, Geordie Hannah, Sarah Ann O'Neill. So, so that, 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 that to me is an extremely interesting point for anybody yeah. watching this here, oh, yeah. um, this, you know, this, this interview. It's, there's, no, there's no, you know, maybe a regional style, there's regional songs, oh, yeah. Ulster songs, yeah. but there's no overall regional style. Oh, maybe, yeah. maybe it's more suited to music. I, yeah. I don't know, I'm not a musician. No, but, no, uh, no you know, you, you'll find that you know, a, a good traditional musician mm -hmm. should also, yeah, and maybe every time they play, they tune them play it differently. You're not yeah. the same as a singer. Yeah. Yeah. Like you're, not singing it, you're not reading dots off a page. So, you, you know, you're, you, every time, every, every... So this is something that I've always tangled with, I think we've all thought, certainly thought about, you know, that, that there's individual, everybody has their individual style, or they should have. But sing maybe the songs from their own area, you know, or try and learn as many as one can. Yeah. Would that be something that you would yeah, well, I mean, advise I would, or, I would, or encourage? I, would, or? I, would, I wouldn't be too precious about it because, yeah. because, because of the times that we're living in. Like it's like it was different when people were just living in the one area and didn't move out. Like I met an awful lot of people never never moved out of their own home. Very, very little, very little. Before he met you? No, but he, his first job was carrying the red flag in front of the steamroller, uh, filling in the potholes, you know, but yeah. they'd have taken the fiddle along and they'd have brought the caravan along and yes. you know, they'd have yes. you know, the keelied it along the road, yeah. filling in the potholes during the summer months. Yes. That was his first job at 14. Uh -huh. He'd taken the fiddle along and, and, and went in and keelied around the, the Glens of Antrimon at that time, you know, back in the, he was born in the, the, the 1920s, you know. So, Outside of people, there are some people who once a year they've gone to the Lammas Fair up in Valley Castle, that would be their outing oh, once yeah. a year, you know, and then outside of that they weren't very far travelled, you know. So when you met Joan 63, I mean, when would have been the first gathering, if you like, for want of a better word, of a group, a large group of singers together under the one roof, in the one room, you know, the likes of Geordie, Eddie Butcher, Joe, yourself, Joe, you know, um, was there any particular event? Well, the, 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 the very first singing, uh, you know, exclusively. Well, that was a singing one, that, 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 that seminar that, that week. Oh, yeah, yeah. That, that, probably, that probably would have been in 1975, and then Sean Cochran, in around the same time, had the, 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 the Drogheda 
would have been in around that 75, 76. Right. Joe and Eddie were at that. <coughs> Jordy did, and Saran didn't come along to the, I think they came, the, the later ones in the early 80s. But the, the, the initial ones, you need to look at those, some of those photographs that were taken at the time. No, they, they, they didn't. But they, I mean, Sean Cochran brought together singers from all over Ireland, and Connemara, like you had um, Josie Shan Jack, you had uh, Daryl Buchanan, Nicholas Tobin, you know, like uh, Paddy Tunney, you, you, you had singers from all over. They, and, and then, of course, we, we, we for the first time we met the lovely, the loud singers, people like Mary Ann Carlin and their brother, Pat Usher, people like that there were. We, we'd never come across them before. That, that was the, that was a whole week. Those, those were weekends of exclusively Same. for singing, you know. So that, that, that was the beginning of it. And then we got the Steve Bullion one going shortly after that, early 1980s. Any show he came in shortly after that. Jordy came in after Jordy died in 87, so 88, I think was the first of the Jordy. So those, but the, those are the, the beginnings of. Uh, as you say, the, the singing mm-hmm. exclusively, like at the Flas, yeah. which you would have had singing that, but they weren't exclusively. Yeah, yeah. And um, you, you, you started, uh, well, professional career in singing in the early 80s, was it? Yeah. Something yeah, at that time. 80, 80, with, um, how did that come about, or I suppose even that come about, how was the decision in your life to let's do this for a career? How did yeah. that. Come about, or did, did you ever think about it, or did it just happen? Or? Just sort of happened. Well, I would have to acknowledge, like Patterning, like give me the, the, the push, you know. Right. right. And uh, we, like, well, we, like, we, we, we got to work. first. The first thing that I, I worked along with was with Flint and uh, McManus and, and Kieran Curran, like for the, those early recording that Patterning uh, produced. Uh, Patrick even produced those two uh, Clada albums, the New Lovers All, like Do Me Justice and New Lovers All. Yes. Yeah. So they were they, they were involved in that. So that, that would have been the really beginning of 81, 82. Right. So that was the beginning of it. And then shortly after that, there we got Skylark going. Mm-hmm. And that went on for 10 years right. to touring with them, you know. But it, 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 it was a difficult decision to make, you know. Yeah, it was just an interesting, you know, from. From I suppose if you go back to the beginning of this conversation, you know, labour of love, uh, family songs, going up to the Sam Henry yeah. within the library, meeting Joe, and then making it your professional career, yeah. which yeah. was something that. Uh, well, I mean, I have to acknowledge that like, Patrick King was the. It was a big, big decision, or was it? Yeah, yeah. of course, but that's when you the mortgage and all those things that go along. Yeah. So, so you're making that much your livelihood then? Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And we, we, we did, we, we had 10 good years, and when they came, we did a lot of travel. Touring, was it? A lot of touring. Yeah, a lot of touring. Was there, yeah. Top line looked good, but then by the time you took all your expenses and played the ring, I could have started. I can imagine, I can imagine. It's, uh, it's a big job. Well, how many yeah. albums did you record? We did, we did four. Four? It's four, a Skylar. Yeah. Uh, yes. And did you, did you enjoy your... Did oh, you yeah. Enjoy yeah. No, I mean, it, it, I was very lucky that the, 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 the musicians were, were top class. Ah, oh, yeah. And you know, like the, the albums were superb. And we, we were very fussy with which songs we would use for a couple well, They had the right amount of the songs. Yeah, anyway. well, I mean, we, we, we were very careful. Like, there's some songs you just wouldn't. Um, we always included at least one unaccompanied big song in yeah. like every, every uh, mm-hmm. like that was part of the thing of it. And it, it, it always uh, it worked. But you, I wouldn't, I wouldn't like to do it uh, like a whole night of one yeah. only singing, you know, like, like for, for that sort of gathering, you know. And then after that, you, you sort of, you, you were saying that earlier on in the conversation, and um, you missed doing children's work at schools. Yeah. It was that with John Campbell, the late John yeah. Campbell. Yeah, that, 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 that was something that happened. Okay, in that, around, in, that, that, that came about in around that same time, in around that. Uh, there was a whole lot of things sort of clicked in it, but in and around that same as the decision was made. Yes. Uh, Brian O'Donnell, who was the uh, traditional arts uh, advisor to Ulster Television, died in uh, early 1980s, and UTV asked me to take on his job. So I, I did that. Uh, there was a series, a series called uh, From Glen to Glen, mm-hmm. and then there was another one called uh, what they call the second tradition called Tranquil. I forget the call. Yes. But there was about 
there's a whole series of, of programs that I did over several years that I, I was the front man for those and advisor. That's right. And I used quite a lot of archive stuff that uh, that the UTV had in, that made in the or you see the television only started up really in the early sixties. Mm -hmm. So they had a lot of black and white footage of people like Johnny Doherty and um, uh, Maggie Barry and John Ray and Plenty Hammond also and various people. So I was going through the archive and I was able to use wee snippets mm -hmm. of archival stuff. Yes. For, the, for that, 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 what, that, that sort of all coincided with that decision. It's funny the way that I things have all, sort of all, all these things all jumped together. Oh, yeah, it was sort of, sort of led one thing led to the other, and all were making sense that it was the right decision. Yeah, but, it's uh, sort of just happening. For yeah, you. but then after after doing it for 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 some ten years, you, you sort of particularly with a group, a group. You see, whilst it, there was no fallout, there was it worked perfectly. <coughs> And it was, it was doing very well. It, 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 economically, it, it just it, it wasn't quite paying the bills, you know. And then the uh, the Arts Council in Northern Ireland, uh, in around the same time, Ian Carson, you see, got the job as a, he was the very first traditional arts officer in these islands. People don't realise that. So Michael Longley, we have to thank for that. Michael Longley was the the, 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 the director of the Arts Council and. Uh, uh, 1968, there was a very successful tour called Room to Rhine, which was uh, Seamus Heaney, Davy Hammond, and Michael Longley did a tour. It was, went down terribly well, and they decided then that uh, they would do, try it again. The following year, it, it was Maggie Barry, uh, the traveller singer, um, uh, Davy Hammond, not, uh, not Davy Hammond in this one, it was uh, Joe Burke. Recording player was and, and uh, the two singers were going to be uh, well, it was particularly Jerry Hicks and Sean Boyle were asked to do the the next one was called You and Yours right. was the following and they, because they were teachers in Armagh and St Patrick's College they couldn't do the whole tour so I was asked to step in and do the other half of the tour <laughs> so all these things were all these things were all helping seem to me they decided they would appoint a full-time traditional arts officer, right. and Kieran Carson got the job. Yes. Yes. So then there was a whole th thing took off from that as well. The, 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 the great vision. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, I mean, you, I mean, you, you, knew, you knew the subject, yeah. which was very important. Yeah, he, was, he wasn't yeah. just an no. administrator. Oh, no. He was actually a, yeah. a flute player and, and a singer. And, singer. and, you, and you knew the tradition, knew what was, what was worth yeah, yeah. preserving. Yeah. So then he started organising events and uh, the 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 Balik uh, was one of the first of the, the ones that he organised. Oh, right. What was that? Was that a uh, six years? Yeah, right. That was uh, 1978. Right. That was the, the Joe just was supposed to perform in that, but it just happened that shortly after Joe died. Right. The first of those, yeah. So that was a that, that was another big big uh, thing that. Him. All these things also seem to come on stream at the same, mm. uh, and around the same. Sort of your path was yeah was uh, not to get too philosophical. I know, was, but uh, when you, I suppose you want to think or look back. On just it, when so. you described around yeah. there, it sort of the path was, was yeah. there for you. You know, it, yeah. just, it just happened. You know, yeah. it was meant for you. Yeah, it just seemed as people would say. You know. I think things were just seemed to be all clicking in at the, the, in, in around that same time. But, and, and the thing about as well, like you know. There seemed to be, you know, from research and from listening to you and various other singers, at that time there was a great interest emerging yeah. in, in, in songs. Yeah, no, there was. There was there, you know? Yeah, there was a sort of a... I mean, like, it, it, was a it was going on, but it, it wasn't as, as, as you said, it wasn't as publicised or as... It was only whenever uh, the Arts Council came on, on, on like it started yeah. to... to you know, give it a profile. And yeah. It, you know, it I mean, as, as, as you always said, it was always there. Oh, it was so but so, it, so You know, even yeah. we talked to Jones earlier when we sang publicly, oh, you know, there was still oh, lots no, of singing no, 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 going no. on. Yeah. And uh, and I think it's another thing we discussed one time as well about the term re revivalist. Yeah. You know, it yeah, wasn't. It didn't, it didn't need to be revived. Like it, it was going on. It was, it was existing. In Ireland, and I, you know, yeah, particularly um, in Ireland. I mean, I know that term's used, as you say, quite a bit 
No, I don't think England probably oh, would, would have been written in Scotland, yeah. but yeah, when, when, when things had changed with the industrial revolution, I, 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 changed a lot. But when you hear some of the older recordings that were made uh, way back in the early part of the century, you can see that there was a good tradition there too, you know, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. in England and Scotland, Scotland mm -hmm. teams and stuff that. Uh, that um, Hamish Henderson and people like that collected in Scotland was brilliant as well, you know. So you know it was a. But they, they, you see, Hamish Henderson told me that if it hadn't have been for Lomax, Alan Lomax coming over from the Labour Congress after the, the Second World War, there would be no um, school of Scottish studies. He said that it was because Lomax with the with the respect. And authority of, of working for the Labour Congress and, and convincing the BBC to do that survey and convincing the University of uh, Edinburgh to, to uh, open the School of Scottish Studies. He wouldn't have had a job, he said, only for Lomax coming over at that time and just after the, the Second World War. So, I mean, there was a whole lot of things going on that helped things and, and uh, brought about. Uh, people realizing that there were uh, things that were, were, were changing and changing fast and utterly. I mean, I suppose on a national front or an international front, you had the folk boom of the Clancy's and yeah, the Dubliners. Yeah. Yeah. But behind all that, there was a lot of this just people singing. Oh, yeah. Playing people, music, yeah. you know, in country houses yeah, or yeah. dance halls or yeah. orange halls or wherever they were doing it. Yeah. Oh. And the, tra and the traveling community. As well. Absolutely, yeah, 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 absolutely. But um, I'm just keeping it alive. I mean, it's it's been a life of of uh, of song and uh, labour of love, as I keep saying, and uh, meeting uh, people that we've mentioned throughout this interview oh, along yeah. the way. And um, I mean, is there is is there, is there any um, you know not to sound too formal, but is there any advice or words of wisdom that you could give any student of song or? To use the term student of traditional song, you know, to, if, when they're starting out on their journey, or is there any advice you would give? Well, it's it's a lot easier now for, for people for people to, <laughs> to you know there, there's so much <coughs> available now. Uh, you know, you do, sometimes you have to look beyond Ireland too, and mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. you, that, that, uh, like I, I mentioned to you yesterday in, in conversation about. Uh, the, the collections that are available over in uh, states, for instance. Yes, yes. yes. Um, there's the, the, the one thing about America and North America and Canada. Uh, you know, they, they, they were at it way back. You know, they were with the technology. They, they bought it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So you'll find all sorts of resources over there, and you'll find like I find extra verses of, like that, 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 that haven't survived here. That they turn up and uh, turned up in, in, in America and went across with immigrants way back, even the earlier immigrations of uh, the uh, 18th century before the famine. Like there were songs went across into the Appalachians and Ozarks that, that would turn up like that one. I was the, the most famous song, one that, that, that Joe, Joe, nice. Joe, like the tantalizing uh, song that Joe had only one verse in the refrain to was the Rattle of the Irishman. And uh, it was a very yeah. yeah, well, it, you see, the, the uh, th that, that's the thing about, about songs like it didn't, it didn't it, it turn up in the bloody Henry collection, so that was the frustrating thing about it. Like, yeah, so then it, it did turn up in Belfast, like because Joe, uh, going as he did with the fiddle uh, as a youngster, 12 year old, down to a neighbor, his brother emigrated after coming back from the, the first world war, and uh, Joe had to go down to the neighbour to get fiddle tunes and get more tuition. His brother was a fiddler too, but he had emigrated to Canada. Harry. So he goes down to, to Willie Clark, to just uh, half a mile down the road to get tunes. It turned out that there was a bit of a Keeley house as well, and there was singing and all sorts of things. And one of the songs that, uh, that Willie sang was the Rattle and Irishman. And uh, Joe could only, he was more interested then. Well, he was getting songs at home, you see, from the mother. But uh, he, he couldn't remember any more of the verse in the chorus, the refrain. But then the, the, the daughter, one of the daughters of, of Willie had emigrated to Belfast uh, after the uh, First World War in the 1920s to Belfast. 
and which was older than, than Joe, and uh, we got for a dress, and I knocked it down. <laughs> and I got the other three verses, and then give it to Kevin McConnell. He recorded it with the Boys of the Lock, and uh, give it to Dolores Keynes. I think she was 14 at the time, yeah. and she recorded the first of Alan album. And who else has recorded? Dick Collins yeah. recorded, Charles the Lady's recorded, the you know, Battlefield Band recorded, you name it, The World and the Wife was recorded. Yeah. And uh, lo and behold, it's turned up in the Ozarks. Yes. Uh, a man called Max Hunter, uh, after the Second World War, he, he was a, a commercial traveller for electrical goods, probably vacuum cleaners and things. And he got one of these new fangled reel to reel tape recorders, 1950s. Mm -hmm. And he's going around the Ozark Highlands yes. and uh, very remote areas and selling, trying to sell the plants. But he'd take the tape recorder with him and he'd record. And he came across this woman, uh, Bertha Lauderdale, up in the Arkansas and uh, the Ozarks, and collected the, the, the sovereign horn. And she had learned it from her grandfather, Tom Mullenweg. Who had left Monaghan in 1834, way before the famine? But then uh, people can you can resource that in yes. the Max Hunter collection. You can hear yes, them. So, story, isn't it? Yeah. It's, so yeah. Uh, so I, I'll, I'll sing it. I'll sing a few verses of it. I'll sing the last verses that came from 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 Bertha Lauderdale. I'll yeah. sing a few verses. <clears throat> so Joe Holmes was the initial thing, and then Mary Clark, who was uh, Mary, uh, she was McQuiston. Was her married name when I tracked her down in Belfast and, and got the other three verses. But I'll just sing a couple of verses of hers and you know, and Joe's first verse and maybe one of her verses and then I'll finish up with uh, with uh, Bertha's <coughs> last verse. <coughs> I am a rambling Irish man in Ulster. I was born in. And many's a happy hour I spent on the banks of sweet Loch Erin. For to live poor I could not endure, and like others of my station, to America I sailed away and left this Irish nation, right hand in the night. Tant in the naft, right tant in the nur and the nandy. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> there you go, you suffer the head like so. <coughs> The night before I went away, I spent in Gwyn, my darling, from three o'clock in the afternoon. Till the break of day next morning. But when that we were going to part, we linked each other's arms. And you may be sure, I am very sure, it wouldn't end both our charms. Right hand in the na, tant in the na. Right hand in the nur and the nandy. Last verse. Mm -hmm. For we're the boys that can't be bent, and yet no danger fearing. On that fair day we took our leave of Campton, me dying sailor. We gave three cheers for old Ireland. In being our former quarter, like a flock of sheep we strand away, shook hands and we parted, right tant in the na, tant in the na, right tant in the nur and the nandy, right tant in the na, tant in the na, right tant in the nur. Running on the well, there's numerous other singers that I haven't spoken about yet. I have to keep you here at four in the morning before I get through half of them, you know. Yeah, but uh, I don't know. So, uh, there's just so you just listening to you, there's just a, a, well, a journey of song there, you know. Um, for anybody watching this here, that you've it just a labor of love 
Well, a liver of them. There's some great memories, I can tell you. Have you any other memories you'd like to share with us? Well, there's, there's so many, but I don't know. Oh. If it, we, we've covered a good bit of it. Well, there's an awful lot of singers I haven't covered and touched upon, really, you know. Yeah. Uh, People you want to talk about? Well, there's, 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 there was all sorts of people. Daley Murphy was was another singer that uh, that uh, would have been recording back in the thirties. People don't realise that she made her very first debut recordings with Richard Hayward. Richard Hayward was from Larne, County Antrim, but he he'd been one of the first people to, to make commercial recordings of what we call folk or traditional songs way back in the twenties and thirties. But she came on the scene in the nineteen thirties. He was already well established and she uh, recorded a duet with him. Uh, it was her very first recordings. But uh, he was making uh, recordings. Like there was one particular one that I sang up in Coleraine, uh, the university where I first met Patrick and her sister Edna, and various other Brian Mullen and various other people who would have been up at uh, Kate Finton, uh, McManus would have been up at Coleraine back in the, the 70s. Gary Hastings, and all those, there was a great gathering of those people that were in the studio yeah. at that time. It all happened to be there. Oh, yeah, and it was great. And um, I remember uh, the, the first um, department of the Irish studies up there in Coleraine, there was a man called Coleman, Coleman O'Hullan was the director of the, 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 the thing, along with a, a cousin of Patrick Eames, uh, Dermy, Den Dermy uh, Devlin. Would have, been, uh, would have been involved in the department back at that time. But uh, Mayo, Mayo Doherty, that was the other man uh, up there. But they used to bring me in, you see, and I, I would bring the, 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 the Ulster Television, would have been formed in the early 60s, and then their, their um, cameras were, were updated. Uh, probably in the late 60s, they got new equipment in, and they gave all their old equipment to the University of Coleraine. So they had it up in their communications department and Liam and uh, Coleman decided that they wanted some uh, film made and they involved me and I brought uh, Joe in and I brought Eddie in and I brought Sally Wade playing the pipes and various people in, uh, local people I brought in to, to, to uh, record them uh, in, in the thing. But uh, uh, Sean McGoyle was up one time you see with, with Jerry Hicks giving the talk you see and then we all went back to um, uh, Jim McGoy. Jim McGoy was no relation of uh, Sean Lee at a pub in Coleraine and Abbey Street called the Oak Tavern and uh, <coughs> we used to have sessions in the back room in it you know so we would uh, go back there and they, uh, they brought up one time they brought uh, this wee boy from he just died there recently uh, called Albert Fry Nice. Uh, Albert Fry was uh, uh, singing in Irish. He'd be brought up to the Gaeltacht in, in Belfast back in the probably the fifties, and, and um, became a real Gaeltacht, you know, and, and so singing a lot of Donegal songs. So he sang this song in Irish, and I replied to him in English, the same song, <laughs> and it turned out that Sean Van Magrena, who was a local. Uh, songsmith and, and Gail Gore from Renafast had given and translated uh, Richard Hayward's recording of the 1930s of this song that I'd learned off a gramophone, an 078 RPM record, nice. you know. Nice. And uh, I, I was able to sing the, the, the song in English before it could be translated into Irish. <laughs> Albert sang it in <laughs> Irish, you think. So the, 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 the wee things like that. that uh, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 The song was. One morning in May, when the fields were gay, serene and pleasant was the weather. I haven't the road so miles from home, among the bonny blooming heather down the moor. In among the heather, over the moor, and through the heather. I haven't the road so miles from home, among the bonny blooming heather down the moor. We jogged along with a lilt of a song, my heart was as light as any feather. Till I met a lass and a very bonny lass, she was good from the dew from off the heather down the moor. And among the heather, o'er the moor, and through the heather. 
The lime and the lass and the birdie bonny lass, she was scooping the dew from off the heather down the moor. And he sang it in Irish as he blew with the same bloody song. Where did he hear that? Richard Hayward? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. He, he recorded that. Oh, he recorded it. Was that so in the Sam Henry book? Uh, there's versions of it. Uh, oh, there's versions of it. Yeah, I think I've heard you sing uh, it before. But I, yeah. I, I sang it over at one of the Edinburgh festivals, and uh, Hamish, was in the, Hamish Henderson was in the audience. And he says, that's... Oh, Mark, well, that's got a great version of that song. I must send you, I must send you a version of that when I get it back to my office. And I was by back in the fortnight gave her a big brown novel, landed from the School of Scottish Studies, and uh, opened it up. And here's a version of the song, handwritten, and sang. Robert, Robert Burns, 1786, <laughs> collected from uh, Jean Glover. Gene Glover in, in Kilmarnock. He was collecting for, mm-hmm. for Johnson, James Johnson. He was collecting, he was a song collector, yeah, as well yes, a yes. And he had collected this from Gene Glover and a footnote from him, he should say, you're glad to know that Gene Glover had no good it. And she died in, in uh, Letter Kenny in 1805. <laughs> right, so did, did she bring the song over with her? Aye. How did they get into the Irish tradition? You know, mm-hmm. the, all the all these wee connections. That, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's all a, it's all a look at, oh, know, yeah. We use the term during this interview as well about I give it to. Uh, yeah. She give it to. You know, it's like oh, yeah. you giving them giving them a drug. Oh, yeah. I give it. You know, it's it's uh, yeah. it's. It's the way it's the terminology and the wording we use, you know, or I got it from him, or I got it from her, you know. The whole thing is just a, a big jigsaw that just it's a jigsaw all these so many pieces. And then when you think of the jigsaw complete, you know, another, you think there's another pops, pops up out of there. Like that, the Roman Irish man there to me is yeah. the big one, you know. Oh, I mean, that oh, but that's only one of the Jesus Christ. But that's like that's a song that everybody's heard, oh, yeah. and then there's this discovery of the Max Hunter yeah. thing, you know. it's it's amazing. It's yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's the whole mm-hmm. beauty of the thing, that it is such a diverse... And, and I think I think, I think, think the one thing as well, I'm sure you would agree, is when, when you get into this for, you know, you learn songs and then you sort of try and get different versions and make, oh. make your own version oh, of, yeah. of a song. Very and I think that's very important as well. Yeah. Because then, and then it means a lot more to you because you've done a bit of homework. Exactly. Um, mm-hmm. And then you feel proud of what you... Oh, no. My faith achieved, you know. I mean, it's, you know, it's, all, it's all the memories that come along with us. Well, every, 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 every song that I sing, it's got, there's so many memories oh. of people and times and crack and fun and venues and, and all what happened. You know, it's... it's uh, well, there's anybody else you've met there you want to talk about? Well, I, think, I think we've covered a great uh, yeah. I think we've covered a great few of them there in the, the course of the... Of the uh, Oh, there's there, there, there so many, like as I say, we could go on for, for, for weeks and songs and people and places and memories and stories that go along with it. Well, do you want to maybe sing us a song and we'll yeah. a bit of you? We could do that. <laughs> well, they, some of them, I mentioned some of the singers in the, uh, at the Antrim Dairy Fiddlers, which would have been some of my early public performance. Although my, my first public performance actually was in the, the Rose Hip Factory in Glenarm. During, during the Second World War there was a, a, a little local industry started up because of the, the, you couldn't get vitamin C, leather, oranges and things like that weren't scarce commodity, you know. So somebody came up with the idea that Rose Hips was very high in vitamin C and they started up this Rose Hip Factory in Glenarm. So my aunt was the the secretary to the boss, and uh, she used to organise these wee concerts. Right. So my mother and I would be, I was really lucky about that, as you can say, being there singing uh, in the Rose Hip Factory. But um, um, yeah, the, uh, what was I going, I was going, I was going into something else there, but I forgot what it was. I forgot what it was. Was gone there. I was going to lead into something there, but I forgot what it was. There's so many. <laughs> so many. It's, uh, there's so much, so yeah. much stuff to say. And, uh, oh, talk oh about yeah, it. one of the singers, and I knew there was a, one, one of these great Cayley houses. That, uh, <coughs> old, an old, old friend of the family, actually, we got the phone call when we were living in Port Rush at this stage, and uh, the phone rang. It was uh, Mary, Mary McGill, one of the great singers that I would have met. Okay, back, she was a neighbour woman, and uh, 
the, the niece around. She wasn't married. Her, Patrick had died, and her brother had died uh, some five years prior to this. This being around the probably late seventies, probably even. Got the phone call anyway uh, from Anna, uh, the niece. Uh, Mary wants to see this. So I got my mother. I wasn't married at the time. Mother and father in the car with head bump or uh, outside my arm into the house and uh, Mary was in her deathbed. The priest was with her. He priest was from uh, funny enough he was from from uh, Coal Island, but he was he was stationed in, in, in the enemy areas and they got they got into the stage and uh, Mary wanted a few songs. So some few songs were sung and uh, she had a present for us. It was a lovely uh, lamp, an oil lamp that you'd hang up with cut glass bowl and still have it. So she, she wanted us to have that to take back with us and sang a few songs anyway and bid her farewell. And just got back home to Port Rush and the phone rang was Anna. She nearly passed away. But uh, this would be her song. It was a sort of gentle hint that have you no home to go to, you know? When she when she started this up on you, it was like a gentle probably the bloody cock was crawling outside, you know. <laughs> Time to go home. <laughs> well she had started off this week, so I think I'll finish off with this anyway. <clears throat> Happy are we all together. Happy are we one and all. May we lead a life of pleasure. May we rise and never fall. Times are hard, we have no fortune, but good health we have for sure. This to us is more important than any wealth or worldly store. Happy are we all together, happy are we one and all. May we lead a life of pleasure, May we rise and never fall. Though how humble is our dwelling, hardships we have shared a few. Happy the day of our meeting, you to me and me to you. Happy are we all together, happy are we one and all. May we lead a life of pleasure, May we rise and never fall. See the miser with his riches, watching o'er with cautious eye. But we'll have fun and social pleasure, and spend our time in harmony. Happy are we all together, happy are we one and all. May we lead a life of pleasure, May we rise and never fall. Friendship makes the heart grow fonder. Friendship makes us all unite. Friendship brings us all together. Twas friendship brought us here tonight. Happy are we all together. Happy are we one and all. May we lead a life of pleasure. May we rise and never fall. Len Graham, thank you very much for you're very welcome. Pleasure to us. Pleasure to talk to us. I'm glad to hear that you're still singing. That's the main thing. Good man. Thank Keep you it very up. much. Keep singing. Thank you. Hope so. <laughs>